name we pray. Amen. Amen. Some partners wrote me, and that's the reason why I'm going in this direction. They said to me, we are not married, we are tired, and it's not only, not only me. That's what she said. And we're coming and we want to change. I don't know who it is. Well, somebody's smiling in the way that I think it is her. But you know, and then I thought to myself, I can come and give you some very well put together words. You understand? But I know where the problem lies for a lot of us. So should I not go there? What do you think? Those of us who are in politics, we know that there is power behind powers. Uh, no. If you don't know, the first time around, the second time around, you get it. Yeah. That there's more to this thing than meets the eye. Right. I want you to know that behind every throne in this physical world, there is an altar. Yes. And today we're going to look at the mystery of altars because when you are done, that problem that you came with will not go back with you. Yeah. See, I'm a very well put together person. Normally, there are things I can't even talk to you about here. But it's the truth. We are supposed to be models of the kingdom, aren't we? The Bible says in Micah chapter 4, verse 1 to 2, that it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be exalted above the mountains and above all the hills. But our lives showing it. Sometimes in one area, not in another. Do you understand what I'm saying? Meanwhile, God says, I hate unfruitfulness. How? John chapter 15, verse 1 to 2, he said, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, I will remove. So in every aspect of your life in which is not unfruitful, God is not in it. Are you listening to me? Yes. I don't want you to. Don't make any excuses for yourself. We all know where the shoe pinches, don't we? Yes. And I have somebody on the keyboard. We all know where the shoe pinches. We know where it hurts. So we should be models. Our lives should be the lives that people look at and say we want to be like you. Yeah. So in some aspects they want to be like us and the others are like, mm hmm. But in the name of Jesus, everything that is a bot in your life when you live here, you are leaving it behind in Jesus' name. Yeah. Everything else is going well. We say, God, but if you could just do this one. Yeah. That is the one we're going for this afternoon in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Altars. First, I want you to know who got my email yesterday that if you could pray for an hour, do so. Who did? Who prayed? Nobody is stopping you from getting your miracle. Amen. 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 See you testify. Amen. So, when we look at altars, the first thing we have to understand is what is an altar? An altar is not just that fetish things that we see, you know, on some movies or in horror movies, you know, Friday the 13th night and stuff like that. Altars are real. An altar is a system of authorization. That means it's a technology that authorizes something to exist. That's what an altar is for. An altar is a portal in the spirit realm to the physical. An altar. It's not just a monument, a structure, a temple. An altar can be a person. Yes. Some strange things happen. You cannot move into the physical realm without either an altar or a body. And I will give you scripture for everything. If I don't give you scripture, don't take it. Matthew chapter 8, verses 29 to 31. We'll move fast because of time. But Jesus was at the, you know, the region of Gadara, and there was this demoniac. Do you remember who was changed there and was going ballistic on everybody? And then when they saw Jesus in verse 29 of Matthew 8, Matthew 8, they said, have you come to punish us before the time? Because when they saw Jesus, they saw the Son of God, and they knew it was illegal. Did you hear me? Illegal. Law does not allow for the Son of God to walk upon the earth. What they could see was the Son of God. What they did not reckon with was that the Son of God was in a physical earth suit. Mm -hmm. It was in the body of a human being. Yes. And I see the whole thing was to teach us about bodies and palm, you know, about the crossover of the spirit realm to the physical. When he was going to throw away the demons out of that the man, the man, the demon said, give us somewhere to go. Because we like this region. We don't want to leave Gadara. Possibly a lot of stuff that was going on in Gadara was responsible, the, the demons were responsible for it. And I think he looked at the, the thing and said, you know what, just enter the swine. And the minute they entered the swine, the swine just went, swine and pigs. The pigs just went down 
they heal the cliff and into the water. That shows that they were destructive spirits. Mm -hmm. So you know they made the man caught himself when they were in the man. So when they got into swine, they made the swine kill themselves. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when you have suicidal thoughts, it is not you. It is. It is something else powering it. Yes. And there's a system of operation that allowed the thing to come into the earth. Are you listening? Yes. So it's a system of authorization. It is a portal. So all these things you see in Doctor Strange and Marvel, they have some basis in truth. So you see Doctor Strange enters through a portal and then suddenly from Tibet is in London. It happens. It takes a lot of spiritual energy, but it happens. And Hunter legitimizes that transportation from the spiritual to the physical. It is a place of invocation. You know what invocation is? When you chant, when you call onto something and give it the right to come into your life or come into a situation. So we invoke God, but others invoke all kinds of things. And I'm sure you've seen people doing the invocation before. It's a platform where the spirit realm can make connection with the physical realm on legal grounds. Now, I want you to understand that God is very legal about things. He does not break his own laws. When he was going to bring Jesus Christ into the world, he needed a vessel to put his own son in. You know they came to a second 14 year old girl and they asked for permission to use her womb. Hail Mary, full of grace, let's say you are amongst the men. And then say, can we use your womb? Did you get that? Can we use your womb? If she had said no, that would have been the end. But she gave permission. What was the permission? Let it be unto you, according to your word. Ah, it happened. Are you getting it? Yes. When they go to Zachariah, you know, and because he is so holy, and they said to him, his wife is going to have children, began to say rubbish. Meanwhile, he's a priest. And the word of the priest is very strong. He said, if we allow this man to continue to talk, he will overturn everything, make him dumb. That was all. And he can't say anything until the time when they had the baby, and they said, what is the name of the child? And he gave the correct answer and said, now you can speak. Yes. <laughs> Do you see permission? And as this was going on, Anna was praying in the temple, remember? Senior was praying in the temple. Just so God could do something on earth. He needs permission. Mm. Why? Is what you should ask. Because you've been taught that God is so powerful. He can do anything. He can. But he did something. He put you on earth and he gave the earth to you. So that anything you must do right now, you must invite him. That is why God is so interested in leaders, in leadership, in those who hold power. It is very important because they determine the destiny of people. So, in Psalm 115 verse 16, he says the heavens, the heavens of heavens belong to God. The earth he has given to the children of men. Please understand. I created the earth, is what we're saying. But I've released it to you. For as long as human beings are here, you operate. Why? Genesis 1, 26, 28. And he created man and ground in his own image. And he said, be fruitful, multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it. Have dominion. He didn't say, I will have dominion. He said, you have dominion. Let me give you an example. If I have a house and I put you in the house as a tenant, as of the time we sign the lease, I cease to be able to enter that house again. It is mine, but I can no longer enter. That is why. That is why. When you do not invite God in through your own prayer altar, things continue to continue in your life exactly the way they are. So today is a day of what? Prayer. That's what we've come to do, to pray. Because we know that there's power when we raise the prayer altar. Am I making sense to you? Yes. So we know already, I don't want to go very long, what is prayer? An altar is a platform, it's a portal. How then do we create you? It's a, sorry, a, 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 a an altar I also need to let you know is a place where covenants are empowered. Therefore, there is no covenant without an altar behind it. I can't say I will do this. I mean, even when you got married, those who are married, you did two things now. You came to an altar, or you came to a justice of peace in an elevated place where it's recognized where there is a there is an ability to make that kind of transaction. Do you, do you understand me? You got there, and then you did two things. You said something. 
You said something. Did you say something? Yeah. Honestly, your mouse got you to what you need to do. That man is your mouse. Say, will you take this? You said, I do. That was it. Everybody took you seriously. They were witnesses. That was the end. You said something. So uh, marriage, by the way, is a covenant. It's not just a contract. Yeah. Christians believe it's a covenant. So it's not about, I don't like the way you're doing it now. I'm going. Uh, no, you have entered one chance. <laughs> I'm not saying if the man abuses you, we already have that conversation. But you understand what I'm saying? It's not that I just don't like him anymore. For any flimsy excuse, you go. It's a covenant. It's a lifelong. I like the way the Catholics do it. You understand? It's a lifelong thing. So we don't just go for any other reason. Anyway, we've seen that a covenant is you know, it's established in the place of an altar, and an altar powers it. Just like there's a battery powering this mic. Now, the funny thing is that the priest of the altar may die, but the altar may not die. Mm. So what you want to go after is the altar. Yeah. Even guys are getting it. And you thought you were coming for some female message, no. <laughs> the effect of an altar can be moral. I need to explain it to especially those who are living in the diaspora. Because if an altar invokes something on you, when you move, the effect moves. So you're there thinking that uh, I come from an Indonesia. Once I can leave an Indonesia, or Congo, like, like I'll be fine. Then you get to Heathrow, and the altar is waiting for you, right? Because the lizard in Congo is a lizard in the US. You get what I'm saying? So altars, the effect can be mobile. There's no distance of the spirit. I've had people say this kind of thing, that they want their sons back, that their sons are in England, they're not coming back. They go to meet some guy, the guy says, he'll come back. So I tell you, leave it to me, I said, he will come back. And then the son hmm, is going out one day in Croydon, and suddenly remembers he has to go back home. Rushes back home, begins to pack, says, I'm not going for long, just two days. I have to see my mom, I'll be back. And that's the last they've heard of him in Croydon. Mm -hmm. His kids are back home in England, everybody's back there. And all the mom did was put on one lamp or the other. Mm -hmm. And called him. Hmm. It's an altar. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm telling you the reason why. You look into some families and you see a pattern. In some families, nobody is there. Five girls, all five are married. Mm -hmm. Once there is a pattern, somebody's agreeing there. Once there is a pattern, the word is pattern. I'm not talking about isolated incidences. I'm talking about pattern. In some families, the men never, ever, ever, ever do well. Their wives must feed them. When it happens the first time, it's not a problem. The second, the third, get up. Something is going on. In some families, they get married and nobody must have a child. I have so many cases I'm dealing with, that's why. She whose testimony you heard, she had those twins after nine years. Mm. There's so many. We dedicated seven babies in England in the last um, the last summer. So <laughs> the priest may die, but that doesn't affect. Okay. So I said altars can be places, they can be monuments, and they can be people. They can be people. Why? Even the Bible says that we should bring ourselves living sacrifices before God. Why? Because an altar is a place of sacrifice. So God expects that we should become living portals. Do you get that? In a good way, not in a bad way. Is anybody getting what I'm saying? Yes. Living sacrifices so people can be portals. People can be portals. Negatively or positively. So Samuel was a positive portal. So when a young man goes so got to him, he stripped naked and was then prophesying all day. When Saul also got to Samuel and could not find his donkeys, he found it. You get to a living portal who is a, who is an altar, your solutions come. How do we deal with altars? We deal with altars in exactly the same way in which they were created. How are altars created? Run by consistency of action. So, if you continue to do the same thing in one place again and again and again and again, after the one, the spirit that governs that activity will come and check it out. So, if there's a hotel and you continue using it as a brother, 
After a while, the spirit of lust will come and sit there, which is why you don't just enter into any hotel room and just go and lie down on the bed. Because you don't know who has been there before you. That's true. Especially if you're strong, you're not a virgin, and you're struggling with something, don't try it. Are you listening to me? Take for instance, I'm not a klepto, but I decide to steal this drunk stick. Third time, the spirit says, there's a, a leeway here. I can use this. Before you know, something comes into my spirit, God forbid, and then I become like, you know, the people just can no longer stop stealing, but they do not start that to be. Do you see, it? it's meditation. It's constant, repetitive action. Invocation. Have you seen meditation? Haven't you seen it? So when you want to enter into a trance, for instance, you begin to chant the same thing again and again and again and again and again and again. And before you know the spirit that you're asking for comes in. But not in the first 10 minutes. Not in the first 20 minutes. Are you getting it? It takes a while, then it happens. For those who know traditional things, don't you see masquerade? They keep wailing and wailing until they get into one weird dervish and then something happens. Mm. It happens in India, it happens in Nigeria, it happens in the New Age here in America. Yes. Yes. And you don't know what the boss, what crystal is under your boss's desk. You think all of you are doing the same thing. And you know wives of prime ministers who go to clairvoyance. Yes, and they believe in tarot and crystals. Yeah. There is the high you rise, the more you do. Yes. That there is power behind all the power. Yes. Is that the power of a prophet or the power of a street priest for the reason? Yes. Mm. There is mm. Every seat has something back in it. Mm. <laughs> if you, you want me to talk to you. How are altars created? By the word and by sacrifice. So there is no altar in which there is no sacrifice. So we see the prophet of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18. In Mount Carmel, Elijah challenges them. And uh, they begin to invoke and invoke. And nothing happens. From morning to noon. Then at noon, if you check 1 Kings 18, they begin to cut themselves with lancets. I want you to show us that. Cut themselves. And you know, it took me a while to understand, but I finally got it. They were spilling their own blood on the altar. Yeah. Not chicken blood, not goose blood. They were saying, Bear, we are about to be disgraced, take my blood. Mm. Do you get it? Mm -hmm. In these days, they'll give dollars because it's like blood to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so people like, give me the wish. Thank you, he take the dollars. <laughs> yes, I am. So, <laughs> so we said, and, and okay. At that point, anyway, they began to call on, they began to cut themselves with, 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 with lancets. And what it was was that they were spilling blood. How do we then deal with altars? We deal with altars by speaking a word against it. The word of faith. Two, by pleading the blood that is above every other blood. What is that blood? You know it Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. It says, it is the blood that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Now, Abel is no mean man. He's the first man that died on the earth. And the first man whose blood entered the earth. Hmm. And he's telling us something that blood has DNA, doctors in the room. And each one has his own unique code. So that the blood of Wemi and the blood of Chumaka speaks differently. And that's it. All blood is not equal. A human is equal, yes. But not all blood is equal. So you see, for instance, that Baal, they got bulls. When bulls did not work, they caught themselves. Because human beings are a higher order of species. I want to give us any examples before we begin to pray of um, altars. So we see Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. And I'll tell you from the early example, moving to when or why do we raise an altar? And then, why do we raise an altar of prayer if we don't pray? Are we moving fast enough? Genesis 8 20. So we see Noah in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. He has just come out of the ark. He looks around, you've heard one of my own messages, and I ask, what does he see? He sees total devastation. Everything is finished. Bleak! No hope! And then in that no hope situation, that means his account is dry, everything is dead. He turns right back, sees an ark. In that ark, there are birds that are supposed to repopulate the earth. He needs them. Just the 
before you need your savings. Your, that's your next egg. These are the very things you need to repopulate this bleak earth. Then, because he understands the mystery of altar, since the first time altar is mentioned in the entire word of God, he goes back into that ark to the very bird that he needs, and he offers seven of every two types of every clean animal that he needs and offers it. And God said in his heart, he smelt it. God is linked to the altars. Yes. You understand what I'm saying? The first time there was a problem on the earth, it was about an altar now. It was Cain and Abel. Yes. Cain came with the sacrifice. Abel came with his. You understand? And those days it was instant. If God takes it, you will know. The smoke rises or does not rise, you will know. So Abel gave his. It brought no response from heaven. Why? It cost him nothing. No blood was spilled. For there to be a sacrifice, the word is sacrifice. There must be pain. Yes. So when you come before God and you drop your change, it does nothing. There's no pain. You didn't care about it. So David says, I will not give to the Lord of that which costs me nothing. It's a spiritual transaction. The emotion must be involved. You must go back home and tell yourself, was everything right to me? Why did I do that? I'll give you an example. Should I? Yes. I know you like to this chapter. So I was in church somewhere. And you know, I was tired of guys just toasting me. Because it started since I was in you to and died. Let them toast it's just I'll tell you why it's Ah, the worst part is for them to toast that. Okay, but because I was in university pretty early, so I was in university at 14. So when I was 16, I was already in like two, three. So people thought I was older than I was. So they were writing all kinds of proposals. One brother used to write poems. I still remember the poem. So I'm now a great, great ghost. I didn't like the brother. I didn't like his name. I'm very so I was not feeling in. You know, I was getting tired. So by the time I was now, you know, even graduated, it was getting too bad. Everybody was seeing visions. I was like, God, just save me. And then, you know, <laughs> hey, I want to give you a secret, but human beings read your prayer points in church. Mm. And I was a leader. So that means I can read someone saying, tell Jumoke she's my wife. I want to be crazy. <laughs> All right. So I got to church and I was praying. And I said, God, you know, I just need a God fairy man. I didn't need a rich man. I just need a God fairy man, someone who believes in prosperity, who loves the Lord and everything. And I heard in my heart, gather my sins unto me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And I took my entire see everything I had in my account and I emptied it. And I told God, this is what I want. Do you know I got married a year to the day, January 26th, that I gave that offer. The truth is I didn't remember. It was when the cats had gone out. Then my mom said, I'm getting married on a Friday. It doesn't make sense. And I thought, yes, why are we getting married on a Friday? Why are we getting married on a Friday? Then I looked at the date and it was January 26th. One year exact. When? Do we raise up altars? So we see first Samuel chapter 7. First Samuel chapter 7, verse 7. In the time of battle, when things are going really bad and we don't know what to do again, you raise an altar to fight for you. So the Israelites said to someone, cease not to pray for us. Because the Philistines are the Philistines are come against them in this day. And they cease not to pray for us. What did Samuel do? He took a lamb. That's it. He took a lamb. Verse 9, and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Then he did what? He prayed. So he didn't just take the lamb and keep quiet. Mm. He took the lamb and he prayed. But the two dimensions. So people they tell you, I know you're a Christian, you don't believe in all these things. We will do it for you, just send one. Mm. Mm. You understand? Mm. Yeah. Because they need that sacrifice. Mm. And once you release the sacrifice, you release the permission that they can do it for you. Mm. You are there, you are present. Unless you didn't work for that money. If you work for that money, you are there. Because money represents your blood. You know now. You know, you know the way you deal with money. You know it's what it's supposed to do. Let me see your blood because it represents your time and your sweat and your energy. You work and then they give you cash. Do you understand? So whoever takes your cash is taking part of your life. Good. So in the time of battle, we raise altars. We see in Genesis chapter 28. In fact, let me add something. I want to just mess with your mind a bit. Second, First Kings chapter three, verse twenty-six and twenty-seven. First Kings three, twenty-six and twenty-seven. 
I want you to understand some things that have happened in some lives when we begin to pray now. 326 to 27. Go to the 2nd Kings 3, 26, 27. I'll tell the story before we get there. So the king of Moab was in battle with the kings of Israel. And um, the battle began to go badly against the king of Moab. And then he took his first son, who was supposed to reign in his stead. Not his second or third son. The first son is the crown prince. <laughs> he's different from all the others. From the day he's born and you make him crown prince, you treat him differently. You concentrate all your energy on him. His tutors are different. What you teach him is different. He means more. He, he's your legacy is the continuance of your kingdom. If he goes, you need to start again with somebody you did not concentrate on. It may not work. All the action, you taught the first son. You understand? All the soft fencing, everything. You put everything. People have been bowing to this son since he was born. Do mm. you get it? So he took that son and offered that son on the, on, on the air. See? He tried to take 700 men to break through the king of Edom, he could not, verse 27. He took his eldest son who would have in his death and he slaughtered him on the wall, verse 28. And, yeah, 27. And there was great indignation against Israel. Isn't that weird? There's supposed to be the people of God, are they? So, a heathen king takes his son and kills him. And then wrath comes upon Israel. What was happening then? Hmm? The blood of who? Of the son. Why? Is it God accepting the blood of the son? Mm -hmm. What? The blood has a voice. Yeah, but I mean, we, we Israel, we prayed before we left home. What's happening? The sacrifice. The sacrifice. The sacrifice. It is a sacrifice to win the battle. It's clear. He said when he couldn't win, he took 700 men, he couldn't win. So he took one human being. Instead, and killed him. That was the thing, we all agree. But let me tell you what it is. What it is is that whatever he had done before coming to battle was not enough. It wasn't enough. The Israelites could easily, their prayers could conquer that everything. He needed a higher power to join him on the battlefield. So sometimes you go into competition with someone and you have what it takes, but in the middle of the contest, something shifts. For you, you didn't shift. You said, I went prayed last week now. <laughs> I prayed last week, I gave last week. They asked for a sacrificial offering, I gave. This people like money. <laughs> so it's okay. But you know, your spirit, things have shifted. Your dreams have changed. Things have changed. You know that the battle is changing. You are in the wood. Because they like money. Now, listen to me. Who watches a lot of rings? There's nothing wrong. Not a lot of rings. Try and be watching movies. Well, I can't help you. I'm trying to help you. Okay, you watch 300. Hallelujah. 300. You see that the Persians came with something called a troll. Mm -hmm. They didn't bring the troll in the beginning of the battle. Mm -hmm. They watched to see where the battle was going. Yes. Just like the king of Moab. When they could no longer deal, they released the troll. This is a troll that they themselves cannot control. It does not do, it kills about 10 of his own people. Friendly fire. So you see, they needed another dimension of demonic spirit. Mm -hmm. They needed to rouse another dimension of demonic spirit so it kills the if you had killed this commander in chief, it's not the same thing. They needed something. So I'm saying one sacrifice sometimes is not all. One prayer is not all. You come again and again and again until you are born. Spiritual things are tangible. They deliver real results. When she said I would tell her go and pray, they said that they didn't have neck. So those who are doctors say, you know what neck is? Necrotizing enteral colitis. Ah, I had to learn the name. <laughs> I would say to her, go back into the, to the surgery now. Go to that child, lay hands on it. They will tell you that the child has recovered from neck. I'm talking about a 10 minute interval. She will do that, come back out, and they will say the child has recovered from neck. She said at 23 weeks when she fell into the law. That's when you saw me going to Newcastle to visit her. The babies were like coke bottles, truly. Nothing but what is coke bottles, like iPhones. 510 grams. 
That's what they want. But where am I going with that? We began to pray. She was dilated five centimeters. It stopped. It brought us. So we're taking her to the labor ward and bringing her back to the general ward and looking at her. Because we needed those babies to be able to see, to have developed lungs. You understand? And 23 weeks, the critical thing is those five days that tip the baby into 24. <laughs> this is someone who was going with me to Israel for my birthday. No, it means something to me. Mm. You don't give up the battle till it is over. Mm. Who would have thought that after that, you see his neck? Oh, what she didn't say in the neck is that they caught Tony's intestines and left 14 centimeters. That's why they said she will never be able to eat like a normal human being. And they said, which mother will put their child through this? When I heard her cry, she cried. I didn't cry that she would eat or she would eat. I cried that they would say that to a woman. That she should let go of her child. So what do I do? Should we stop feeding her? And that was Tony you saw. The one they said will not be able to eat. You know, I have to say, I'm coming with dusting powder. Dusting powder is different from dusting powder. <laughs> because the child is so big. Do you know what I'm saying? It's breastfeeding, it's digesting the food. Whatever the length of the intestine is, it is functioning. Mm -hmm. Said she was going to leave in the hospital for two years. She's been discharged next week. How much time has gone on? All that. You don't say I've struck it once, let me let it go. You come, but you get what you want. I said, I saw two children coming out of the hospital when I prayed with Ayuka. I said, in front you are holding the boy, behind is the girl, and that's what has happened. The boy went home first, and he now visits his sister in the hospital. The sister too is coming out. <laughs> they kept scaling it back. She'll spend four years in the hospital. No, it is two. Ah, she's doing so well, one and a half years. Okay, she's coming next week. Amen. So do not the doctors are giving me or what you have been led to believe about yourself. I'm still on when do we raise altars. We raise altars for memorials. Genesis 28. And this is where a lot of us miss it. When God speaks to you in a place, a revelation comes, it's strong. So for, for Jacob, it was Bethel. He got there, slept. He did not know that in Genesis 12, his grandfather, not his father, his grandfather had passed through there and raised an altar to the east and to the west of that place. Do you get it? So he was in a portal. It doesn't mean if you had passed, you have any encounter. But he was a child of that covenant. Hey, this you know is important. He was a child of that covenant. So when he got there, the covenant of the place came asking for him. We don't get it. He didn't pray. He didn't pray. The God of that area said, are you related to Abraham? Mm -hmm. He said, yes, I have an arrangement between you. Mm -hmm. It's the same way some people get married and what they've dedicated them to say is, hey. are you related to my man? Mm -hmm. Whatever. Ah, mm -hmm. I owe you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He didn't pray. It's the same way if your father left you a house in Hampstead or left you a house in Park Avenue, would you not take it? Mm -hmm. It's inheritance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's inheritance. So what you do, it doesn't mean that you are locked in for life, but you reject it. Just the same. That's how you get out of the inheritance your father gives you. He gives you a house. You say, I don't want it. The lawyer says, sign. Sign. I don't want it. I you go. Who is going to be chasing you with the keys of the house after that? Mm -hmm. You can give me the key of the house. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. So that is how that happened to A place of memorials. So when God speaks to, to, to you somewhere, what he did, as soon as he got up, he raised up an altar in that place and poured oil into other place. So he marked the place as a memorial. So you do it once so that the prophecy that is spoken over you will be established. So people miss it so much. Somebody prays for you, prophecies, everything, the whole room is shaking. Then you dust your plates and go home. That's why a lot of you just fall and get up. Nothing ever happens. You don't raise an altar, you don't do nothing there. But people don't teach you this way because they're afraid that you're going to say something bad about them. So you raise for a memorial. So that prophecy will be established to draw value out of spiritual experiences. 
So the spiritual experience is there, but how we meet manifest in the physical, there is more to it. It's like having a dream, but how will the dream come to pass? Are you listening? Yes. So you see them raising altars wherever God spoke to them. Wherever God speaks to you, it's your Bethel, you raise altars. So here is a teaching because we're going to pray now. I said, in which cases do you raise altars? Give me any. Memorial, yeah. that's the last one. Time of what? Yes, the time of what? Okay, I'm favoring this side because I thought the columns of this W. This is not right. This is who came first. So, <laughs> when do you raise an altar? They said memorial. Somebody has not said something. Time of battle? Yes. When, 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 when things are going bad, yes. you need an intervention. Yeah. The Bible says in Samuel 18, buy the sacrifice with horns, even though it's the horns of the altar. Yes. What it means is when you put a sacrifice on the altar that God sees, something will wake up. Yes. That is what Solomon did. When he killed a thousand pounds of two bullocks, it is God who came to meet him. You are chasing God, God chased on you. Spiritual dimension in what you have and release what you have. That's why God said to Moses, What is in your hand? He said, He said, Drop it. It was when he dropped it that he knew what it was. So Noah was sowing for prosperity, for multiplication. Do you get what I'm saying? And we can also do so for restoration so that you have the power to bring the earth back to where it should go. Good. What do you do? You speak the word. And you do what again? You plead the blood. Thank you. The third thing you can do is raise a sacrifice. Or you plead the blood. Because that blood speaks better things than the blood of bulls and ghosts. And I said, how does a, a, how do you get to a place where you, 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 you create an all-time place? By consistency of practice. 